good morning, everybody. I'm happy to welcome you to Sabbath School at Avondale Memorial Church. And welcome, too, to those people who are watching online. Do you sometimes feel that you're like Alice in Wonderland and you've fallen down a rabbit hole into an entirely different world to the one that we used to? Well, I have a message for you. In spite of the fact that it seems as if we have six mad hatters instead of only one, Mrs White tells us in Life Sketches that we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget the way God has left, led in the past. So I'd like you to turn to the person next to you or behind you, give them a smile and say, we're okay. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to worshipping our Lord in song. Our first song is Greater Than Our Sin. Grace can be generally defined as unmerited favour. God's favour toward the unworthy or God's benevolence on the undeserving. In his grace, God is willing to forgive us and bless us, even though we fall short of living righteously. Join us as we sing. It tells me you ought to stand for this one. Saviour's sacrifice. He is worthy of our praise. His sacrifice has given us the hope of an eternity spent with him. Let's continue and give praise and thanks by singing, Father, I thank you. I praise you for calling 
us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for bringing us here together where we can worship you freely. We thank you for the gift of life. Lord, as we study your word this morning, may your Holy Spirit fill us. May your presence fill this place. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath to you all. It is such a pleasure to be able to stand in front of you and to have this privilege to share some spotlight, mission spotlight from Pacific Adventist University. learn that many of you have been spending many of your time <clears throat> in mission work and I also learned that a few of you have been in PAU serving there way before we even know that PAU exists so it's a privilege to share to you what is PAU doing at the moment well, before I went into that, I think it's, a, it's fair to give a brief introduction about myself. I'm David Vallal Magasilo. I'm teaching at PAU uh, Old Testament. And I'm with my wife, Olin, and my daughter, Rachel. And we are originally from India, though we don't, we don't really look like Indian, but we come from India. And I'm proud to be Indian. So uh, that's the place where we come from. You can see in the map on the top left from your side will be at the right top corner. You can see the red dot there. That's the part of India that we come from. So it's in the east, we have Myanmar. And on the west, we have uh, uh, Bangladesh. And I worked in my conference for about six years and after that I went to Philippines to study and then I completed my studies there in 2019 and I got a call to come to PAU uh, towards the end of uh, 2019 and we finally could get there in uh, 2020 February 11 and we were warmly welcomed by the students there. And when we arrived at PAU, uh, the place was really, really beautiful. I took a few shots, and these are shots that I take, and uh, we, we just love the place from the first sight. However, soon after we landed in PAU, then COVID happened. And we were kind of disconnected. Neighbors could not come and visit us. And we started feeling quite lonely. We started missing home. But that's how life is going to be for the next two years. And it was difficult, but amazingly, PAU and PNG survived COVID. And it was really an amazing experience. Uh, I've never been, I've, I've never tried, how do we call it? testing COVID that I have never used, I would say. So back there in PAU, we are, uh, there was a moment where we have uh, about 200 positive cases on campus. We prayed about it and amazingly, all of those cases were gone after a few weeks. And life was almost like normal. We could have many of those activities. These are some of the activities from the adventure uh, camping that they have. Church activities goes on, and these are some of the uh, children ministries program that we could still continue to have. And then classes are offered later on online, but still uh, there was a lot of face-to-face uh, -face class. And ministries goes on. This is a part of our first, uh, gospel explosion, 
after the end of the gospel explosion. I think there was about 24 uh, souls were brought to Jesus Christ. And that was a big celebration that we have. And COVID does cause us to take a part that we don't dare to take before. And PAU, like many other churches around the world, started going online. If you're interested, just to check it out, you can look at Koyari Park English Church, and then you'll find our Facebook page where we broadcast our uh, worship service every Sabbath day. And some of the programs that you run from here, like we are the church, we also uh, share it to the page as well. So we are trying our best to pull all the information, good information, and try to share it to others as well. And also COVID pushed us into what we call worship sites because the church that we have is not big enough to hold all of us. So we have to kind of go into school, different schools. And at the moment, we have seven worship sites, including the main church. And because of this worship site, it's a challenge, of course, for the lecturers because we are really, uh, our schedule are really tight. And we still need to cater for the Sabbath programs, just like we be, then also become a church pastor. So, but anyway, through these uh, chances for students to participate in the, in the church activities increase, and we see that as a positive uh, result out of that. So we praise God for the uncomfortable situations that we were. And on the academic side, PAU also started going online. At first, it was challenging because of the bandwidth, uh, small bandwidth that we have. We increase, and now things are going very well. So classes started this week, but I'm on holiday, and I could still teach them through, uh, through uh, Moodle. So that's some, some, some progress that we made in PAU. And during COVID, these are some of our students and some of the faculties as well. We could have a graduation. Uh, about 24 students graduated from the theology department. And then we praise God for that as well. Now, I think some of you might be interested in some of these statistics. So I'll just put a little bit and then we'll end the report. So this is the chart for the enrollment. Until 2019, things were going uh, kind of rising gradually. You can see from 2017, 18, and 19, the bar are going up. But 2020 and 2021, it comes, it drops a little, but not too badly. And this year, we started picking up again, and we have uh, hope that next year and in the in the next five years, uh, enrollment will increase. And this is the uh, enrollment for those who would like to stay in the dorms. And uh, maybe on the, on, the, on the top row, I have ladies' dorms, those who are residing on campus in the dormitories. Uh, at the moment, let's look at the last column, 2022. 395 students are at the girls' ladies' dorms, and 368 are in men's dorms, and 35 married students we have. Altogether, on campus, we have 798 students. And we also have 680, 48 students who come from, from town every day. So at the, the current count at PAU is uh, 146, 1,000, sorry, 1,446 students. And of these, 64% are seven-day Adventists, and 36% are non-Adventists. And as a worship site, we are trying to kind of gear ourselves, trying to see how we can reach these uh, 36 persons of our non-Adventist students. And this is the report that I got two, two weeks ago from our registers. He says that in 2022, we have received more than 2,000 plus eligible applicants, new applicants who would like to join PAU. But because of the seed limitation that we have, we could only accept 450 students. And this year, we are expecting to graduate about 352 students from PAU. Well, uh, this is the last picture that I would like to show you. This is the currently uh, 
missionaries working at PAU. And I don't know if you're familiar with that two in the center, Dr. Park Lee and Will Mali. I think they just retired and they are probably among us here. So that is uh, uh, current uh, missionaries at PAU. We have from Indonesia, we, you, we have your very own Dr. David Tasker and Dr. Carol Tasker. And uh, Lee's family just left us. Next is the uh, Ang's family from Philippines, but they just left us as well. Dr. Chi and another family from Philippines as well, and our family. Thank you so much. May God bless each one of you, and please continue to pray for us. was interesting to hear those statistics, wasn't it? I wonder if you can tell us, um, with the effect of COVID, and now that's becoming a little bit historical, um, you know, I noticed you've got seven sites of worship at the uni. Mm -hmm. Are those seven sites still being frequented in person, um, even after the COVID? or is it a little bit different now? Are people more worshipping online in front of the YouTube? Well, that's the thing with uh, Papua New Guinea. I think it, it has to do with the culture. They are social people. Even during COVID, they want to break open the, the door and then just want to worship together. And they are not scared at all, and somehow we survive. So the worship sites still work very much, but we modify a little bit we try to combine a few churches in the big church, like the main event. This week we'll be having our week of prayer, so that's when it will be combined. Mm -hmm. And then otherwise, during the semester, we break out into those worship sites and try to get as much involvement from the students as possible. But once the semester ends, uh, of course the student left, so we come back to the main <coughs> church. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, wonderful to hear the update. Okay, well, that's one of the ports that we support financially, our PAU. And of course, in 13th Sabbath, we're going to be supporting projects in South America. Um, but today, the offerings that we're going to give uh, will be for mission work around the world. And we do that most of the time, don't we? It's just that we have the special projects on 13th Sabbath. All right, where are we, deacons? Let's um, gather at the front here and then we will pray about our giving today. Okay. All right, let's bow our heads where we are. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that in the work of ministry we're able to support wonderful initiatives uh, in the name of Christ and today we want to do this by faith again and ask that you would use these monies that we are about to give to further good things in the gospel message of going, going to the world. We thank you that we can do this that we are blessed and that we can participate in this as part of our worship. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Testing, maybe not. Yes, we are. Good morning, Memorial Church. Glad to be with you. I wanted to bring you a special music today, a simple worship song, but uh, there are some stories connected with it. The song is called All To Us. It's written by Chris Tomlin. And those of you who are musicians and who look at such things will be really interested to know Chris Tomlin is the most sung song and hymn writer in the Christian church today. Um, I would be pretty certain that you've sung some of his songs here at Memorial. Um, if you were living back in the age of Isaac Watts, he was writing all the hymns and songs. Well, in our generation, it's Chris Tomlin, a um, dedicated uh, American Christian and musician. I'm presenting it to you with some background slides from Lord Howe Island, and I need to explain why. Just a couple of months ago, with a group of six friends, I travelled to Lord Howe Island for about three weeks of ministry in the little Adventist church there. I was really pleased to be back there. I'd been there once in the 80s, but my real interest is the fact that my grandpa, dear old pastor A.H. Ferris, was pastor there for about 25 years at the beginning of the 1900s and my mum was born there so I was really keen to get back and I did find one dear old lady who went to school with my mother and lots of people with memories of the Ferris clan so Lord Howe Island pictures are at the back of the words that you will see but for now, let me just tell you a little bit about the island. We have some pictures here. And here's a view from up on one of the really high ridges, looking back to these fabulous two mountains, Mount Gower and Mount Lidgeberg. And you'll see them all in the words of the song as we play it to you. I wanted to tell you a particular story. Here's a picture of a friend we made on Lord Howe Island, Bruce Thompson and his wife. Bruce is involved in the whole process of eradicating feral animals and weeds from the island. Lord Howe is a world heritage space and they've just about dealt a deadly blow to all feral animals and even all weeds. And Bruce was in charge of staking the whole island into squares and eradicating weeds from every square, mountains and all. He saw me one day and he said, Lyle, a few months ago I was up halfway up Mount Lidgebird and I saw an amazing thing carved in the stem of a palm tree. He said, I'd love to take you up and see it. I think you will be interested and so he took me up there and this is what we saw. I'll translate for you in case you can't see. This says D. Ferris, the first of the 12th of 26. So what we were looking at here was something carved in a tree by my uncle David Ferris, who may be known to many of you. In between his time training in ministry at Avondale and in nursing at the Sydney Adventist Hospital, he spent a year on Lord Howe. He obviously ranged far and wide and here he was halfway up Mount Lidgebird with his name and the date of 1926 carved in that palm tree. We took a selfie, all three of us, around this palm tree and uh, I paced posted this on the Ferris family website and Ferris's came from all over Australia really cheering to see what is nearly a hundred year old memory of a precious uncle, Pastor David Ferris. Coming back down, uh, we look and the next slide shows you the two mountains, Gower on the right, Lidgebird on the left. Um, the curator of the museum pointed out to me there's a a natural phenomena in the uh, cliffs at the lower edge of Lidgebird that looks for all the world like a cross. And in some times of the day, it's very striking. Uh, other times, not so easy to see. But I think you can see it there as the arrow points to the cross. And in case you missed it, I've just showed you a close-up. 
that outlines this formation which uh, we got to see nearly every day that we were there. And in fact, it's in all the pictures that you'll see behind the words, only it's so far away you probably won't see the cross, but I hope you gain the inspiration of the cross which drove Chris Tomlin when he wrote the song. Good morning, everyone. 
That presentation, Lyle, brought lots of memories back to me. When I was about 11 years old, we lived in Alton Road. And uh, further down Alton Road, Lyle's grandma and grandpa lived. And um, they had, of course, been back from Lord Howe for some time. But Lyle's grandma was quite an artist. And the first time I re recall seeing Mount Gower was a painting that she had done of it. Every Sunday morning, I used to walk down Alton Road to Ferris's house, and Mrs. Ferris used to give me a painting lesson. She taught me oil painting. Uh, that went on for, I don't know, a couple of years. Um, sixpence a lesson <laughs> is what I had to pay for my painting lessons, and I've been grateful for those painting lessons ever since. So I have a soft spot for Mount Gower and for Mar Ferris, Grand Mar Ferris. She was a great lady, and I remember her well. Anyway, I suppose we better get to the Sabbath school lesson. Let me see if the technology is going to work. I wonder whether somebody at the front would like to be the operator of the technology. It saves me looking around to see where everything is. Um, can, does somebody know how to use this thing? I'd like to introduce our study by just a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open your word today and uh, consider this hope that we have, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and may the hope burn brightly for Jesus' sake. Amen. You, I must apologise for not following the Sabbath school lesson pamphlet particularly uh, slavishly, but I hope that uh, you realise that I am actually covering the Sabbath school lesson for today. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. The last verse says, And now abideth hope, uh, sorry, faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. While Paul places love as the greatest of the three abiding values, the fact that he includes hope among the three shows that he places great value on it as a most durable motivator for the Christian. What about hope? Where does it fit in? And how does hope function? And that is not a rhetorical question. If you would like to answer a question, just put your hand up so that these roving microphones can, can identify you. How does hope function? What is it? We talk about hope, okay. What is it? What does it do? That light up there is a problem to me because I can't see people clearly because of it. Does it need to be on me for the cameras, I suppose? Right, who's answering, who's going to answer the question? What is hope? There's a hand somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. Here. Thank you, Dr. Barry Hill. has been singing to us and now he's going to share his wisdom with us. Right. Doctor. I find it very difficult because of these bright lights to, to, to see clearly. Look, if you see a hand up, just 
take the microphone to where the hand is and we'll take it. Well, up here, please. Hello. This one. Um, hope. A few weeks ago, we defined that the crucible is a hot pot and you're in it. You hope that the, it will cool down and that you'll get out. Thank you. That's a new angle on it. Any other? It gives us something to live for, something tangible, something to look forward to. And in fact, it can be life and death. As we saw in the prison camps like Auschwitz, unless they had hope, they died. Thank you. Very important. Any other angle on it? This is taking too long. Have we got, here's another hand here. We're going to be going here till, till uh, 11 o'clock if we're going to wait too long between I every answer. I the dictionary. To want something to happen with a sense of expectation that it might. Like, I hope everyone enjoyed the meal. I am still hoping that all will turn out well. Thank you. Well, that's a good dictionary definition. Rosemary. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. We have faith. Now, faith is the, the substance of things hoped for. It's the foundation upon which we base our hope. If we don't have faith, we really don't have hope. But when we look at that verse, Faith and hope are only needed in this world where things are uncertain. Love is the greatest because love abides forever. God is love. Thank and the you. whole of the universe is based on love. So faith and hope go together and love continues when those two are no longer needed. Thank you. I'm glad you raised that because I was going to if I'd remembered, I was going to point out that love actually is a defining characteristic of God. That's why it's the greatest. But hope is very important. Faith and hope bring healing mentally, spiritually and physically. Those who have hope recover more quickly um, after surgery in hospitals and it's something quite wonderful. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the next slide, shall we? If we can get this thing to work. Right. Consider this hypothetical scenario. Notice I said hypothetical. I offer you $10,000 if you can, unassisted by any technology, lift a weight of 500 kilograms. The picture you can see there is a, a gentleman called Haftor Bornson, who set a world record in May 2020, lifting 501 kilograms. He stood six foot nine in height and weighed 193 kilos. So, so here's a man who can lift 501 kilos, but he has, he has a world record for doing it. I'm putting it to you. How many of you are going to put your hand up and say, I'm prepared to take that challenge of lifting 500 kilos? Have I got any takers? Looks like not. Can we have the next slide, please? Now I offer you $1,000 if you can lift 50 kilos any takers? It's hypothetical. But, and so you can put your hand up hypothetically. In other words, you, you reckon you could probably lift 50 kilos. I see quite a few hands. What made the difference? What makes the difference between you thinking, yes, I'll take that on, or no, I'm not? What makes the difference? Peter. The second one is realistic and hope must be based 
on realism? Very good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Oh, we've got it. The first is what? Impossible. You have no hope of success. I doubt that there's any world-class weightlifters among us here this morning, and that's not to be derogatory, that's just realistic. The second is possible, and therefore you have a high hope of success. So the difference between whether you are prepared to try something depends on whether you have the hope of success or whether you have no hope of success. Is that right? Is it? Well then, what does it mean to hope? I'm talking about in the Christian context now. Let's go to the next... Uh... Oh, well, that, this is just repeating. Hope is believing that something's possible or that something good will happen. It's a state of mind. When we are in a tough situation, should we, be, should we try to preserve hope? Now, here's, this is one where you can answer whatever way you like with a reason. Should, should we always try to preserve hope? Or should we sometimes accept the fact that something is not possible? The hand up here. Where are these mics? Thank you. In dire circumstances, when an ambulance arrives and or a first aid person comes to the side of the ailing person, they generally will say, something of hope to the person. You know, you, you'll be fine, you, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, and they hold their hand and you'll be fine, despite the outcome. They still engender hope. Yes, it's very important, usually, to have hope. I can think of some situations where hope could be unrealistic, but we're talking about the Christian life, so that's different. Let's have a look at what we've got on the screen there now. By now you've probably worked out that I have a world view that sees the war between God and Satan as the overarching influence in the life of the Christian, the great controversy we call it. It affects everything we do. It's the theme of the whole Bible and the reason for Jesus coming down to this earth. It's Satan's objective to keep us out of God's kingdom. So how do you think he tries to discourage us? Keep in mind the scenario we've just been talking about. Now, uh, don't turn over the next slide yet because uh, I would like people to think about it without having anything to prompt them. How do you think Satan deals with us when it comes to our hope? What's he try to do? Pardon? Pardon? we lose hope, then where do you go? Okay, so Satan tries to destroy our hope, is that right? Our lesson today is called indestructible hope, so it's right, this is right on it. Satan wants to take away our hope. Now how does he do it? Hope of what, by the way? What is, was it, what is the hope that Satan tries to destroy? This is important. What is the hope that Satan tries to destroy. Hope for what? And over here. Satan starts with doubt. Doubt is the opening wedge that Satan uses to destroy hope and it allows him to come in and take possession. Right, so here's a warning against doubt. That's one of the things. Good answer, Peter. Our hope is based on the belief that we are going to have an eternal relationship 
with Jesus and with his father and I think Satan wants to bring doubt that we can ever reach a standard which we can't in ourselves anyway. Thank you. You're, get, you're getting onto the general area that I want to move the conversation. Yes. There's a lot of things that, tr that Satan tries to destroy our hope in. One is our hope that when we're in the crucible, God is with us and he will see us through it. That's one of the big ones that we all face every day. But the other hope that he tries, or one of the other hopes he tries to destroy is that God is faithful, that he has promised us eternal life if we believe in, in his son and accept him as our saviour. And he wants to destroy the hope of eternal life with God and that God loves us so much. Thank you. Yes. Any other suggestions before I throw up the next slide? All right. Can I have the next, next slide, please? Okay. There are various lines of attack. I've just suggested three possible lines of attack that Satan uses. What it is that we hope for is, uh, I think Peter mentioned it, the hope of that eternal relationship with Jesus. I'll put it in simple words and say hope of salvation, right? We, we are looking forward to that eternity with the Lord. So these are some of the lines that Satan throws at us. You can't do it. It's not possible to attain salvation. Have you ever heard anyone make comments to that effect that it's no use trying because there's, there's no hope, you just can't do it? Is that a... Or doesn't anyone feel that way? I'm a bit surprised because it seems to me that uh, maybe not among us here, but it's certainly a, a common theme. You can't do it is another one, but God doesn't expect you to. He'll save you even if you don't really try too hard to obey him. In other words, God's a God of love. He threatens you, but really he's going to save you anyway. Have you heard that one? Yes? I'm sure you have. And here's the one that the lesson points out. God doesn't care what happens to you. You're on your own and you can't make it. Ever been tempted with that one? You're on your own. Let's go back to our hypothetical challenge in the next slide. How could you move the challenge of lifting 500 kilograms from being hopeless to being possible? In other words, what can you do when you are faced with a, an impossible situation, a hopeless situation, to change it into a possible situation? What are the options? What, what, just come up with some suggestions as to what you could do to change this situation from being impossible to being possible. You could ask for help. Thank you. Help from whom? Very strong people, but in a spiritual sense, from God. Okay, okay. Uh, from God, you say. Therefore, let me say you can put a supernatural element into it, all right? Something greater than man, yes? I, think, I was thinking something the same. We, we've just got to give it all to God and let him do the work for us. Of course, we can't do it by ourselves at all. Completely commit to God for our help. That's a good point. Yes, thank you. And we need to stress that. Um, there's another option that's sort of closely related to this, and that is... Oh, here's another. I just want to make the point God is going to give us the ability to lift 500 kilos because it's not going to glorify him or further the kingdom. So God only provides the impossible so that he is glorified. Now that may be the healing of someone from an incurable disease 
or a circumstance that changes that's totally unexpected, where God will be glorified and therefore our trust and our faith, not just ours but others around us who know the situation, will be increased and that's how God works. Thank also, you. And, and we're going to come to something in Job later about that. There's yes. also a saying, God helps those that help themselves. So a little bit of training might not go astray as well. Okay, that's another option. While we're on the funny ones, we had an Australian weightlifter at one of the Olympic Games that earned us a gold medal. And I was amazed to see a picture of him about six months later. And he was actually a fisherman in South Australia. And he weighed just an average man's weight. And he used to, when he was challenged with lifting big weights, he'd start eating. (laughs) Maybe we ought to eat the word of God a bit more. I was going to say thank you. Yes, that's the, that's, that's, in other words, strengthen ourselves on the word of God will, will definitely change the situation. There's, a, there's another, talking about funny stories, those of you who know Samoa, particularly a few years back, will know that every village in Samoa has a cricket pitch. Is that right? And uh, cricket's a very popular game. However, Samoan cricket is a little bit different from the cricket you see on your TV screens because the chiefs uh, can be on the team to play cricket. Now, a Samoan chief is a very dignified person and one thing about dignified people in Samoa is they don't run. So when the Samoan chief is at the crease batting and he hits the ball, he doesn't run he gets a young teenage fellow to do the running for him. Now, transfer that idea of having a substitute into the situation that we're talking about now. If something's impossible, but there's somebody else who can do it, what about letting them do it and asking them to do it? Who is it? that as Christians we ask to do the impossible for us. You can just call out the answer. Nobody's calling anything. I thought that the whole idea of Jesus living in us was because he is able to to uh, make the, po- the impossible possible. Let's go over to the next slide. I think, yes, that's the one, that's the one. Roman, oh sorry, Galatians 2.20. Would someone like to just look up Galatians 2.20 and put your hand up and read it out so that we can all hear? Galatians 2.20 has in it the idea of somebody else doing something. Yes. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, not, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Isn't that an amazing verse? The life, Paul says that the life he lives is really not his own. It is Christ living out his life in him. Now there's another thing that can give us hope when it comes to God's working in our lives and that's Romans, that's spoken of in Romans 8, 28. Most of you probably know this verse. It says that what does God do? Makes all things work together for good to those who are called 
according to God's purpose. In other words, another thing that can make things work out, hopefully in our lives, is that we obey God's purpose for our lives and that we answer the call that he gives us. Let's go to the next slide. How is salvation possible? And uh, there's a lot of discussion here. I'm, I was tempted to get on to last generation theology, but I resisted the temptation. Because it is a gift from God, Romans 6.23. What does Romans 6.23 say? Someone got it, can read it, or just recite it? Romans 6.23 says, But the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, justification, which is the God making us as though we had never sinned, justification is a gift of God. Some people think that sanctification is different, but I want to point something else, else out to you and that is um, if uh, you look at Colossians 1 27 someone, I'd like to, someone to read this one please Colossians 1 27 any hands To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, so <clears throat> justification is Christ for us. Sanctification is Christ in us. Is that right? So our hope, if it's to be indestructible, has to depend on something other than ourselves. We're fallible humans. But because of uh, the fact that Christ died for us, so our hope can be indestructible. The demarcation between one true religion and all others, all other variants, whether, is whether we have to do anything to earn our salvation. We can have no hope in ourselves, but we can have every hope in Christ. Now, I want to just take you through three examples in Scripture. Job 38, verses 2 and 3. Now, this, these verses come from the part of the book of Job, right near the end, where all the arguing has been going on about whether Job's good or bad or whatever, and uh, ultimately God steps in and he deals with the situation by uh, telling, talking straight to Job and pointing out a few things to him. I'd like you to look at Job 38 verses 2 and 3 if you could just uh, somebody find it or perhaps to save time I'll read it. This is what God says. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? And then he says to Job in verse 3, Now prepare yourselves like a man. I'll question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when, when I laid the foundations of the earth? And then he goes on for a couple of chapters asking Job, Where were you when this happened? What about this? What about that? What is the message God is trying to get across to Job in these verses? What is the message that God is trying to get across to Job? Because that's a message that can be important for us. Peter. You may not understand me, just trust me because I'm much greater than you are. Thank you. Thank you. 
that is a good answer because it is an answer that we can apply to ourselves. God is simply pointing out to Job how much greater he is than Job and therefore he deserves our trust. If we want our hope to be built up, we've got to have a clear picture of an amazing, powerful God that we can trust. True? Look at Jeremiah chapter 29 and the first few verses. Jeremiah 29, the first few verses, let's have a look. I'm not going to read the first 10 verses but I'm going to read just a selection. First of all, verse 4. By the way, this story is the story of Jeremiah the prophet sending a message to the exiles in Babylon. Now, the exiles in Babylon were fairly discouraged, as you can imagine. They'd been carried away from Jerusalem over to Babylon. They didn't know what was happening. Their hope was at a very low ebb. So God decided to send them a message through the prophet Jeremiah. And this is what he said. He wrote a letter. And um, thus saith, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. That's the first thing in the message that's important. Who was behind the captivity. Who was it? Was it Nebuchadnezzar? He was simply the instrument. God was behind it. God said, I have caused you to be carried away. So the first thing to remember when things are bad is that God can be behind some of these things that we don't particularly like. And then he says, build houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, and so on. In other words, get on with life. Get on with life. And verse 7, And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. In other words, God's saying to them, you've got to pray for Babylon, because if Babylon does well, you will do well. In other words, if you're in a difficult situation... Don't just grizzle and moan about it. Ask God to take control and deal with it. And then we can go down and, and uh, go to verse 10. For thus saith the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. In this case, God chooses to give a definite time to his people to look forward to and uh, that's how he uh, built up the hope of his people in Babylon finally I'd like you to have a look at Hebrews chapter 12 and here we find Paul talking about the the uh, situation that uh, happens when God disciplines us. Where are we? Verse 6. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. What do we think of parents who never discipline their children? <laughs> we have a few questions, don't we? Because discipline, we know, is necessary for character development. So God disciplines us and we've got to remember the reason he disciplines us is why? Because? Because he loves us, right? I'd like you to uh, look finally at um, this verse in Titus 2, 11 to 14. And it's talking here about the blessed hope. The blessed hope. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God, great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own people, zealous for good works. How's our time going? Oh, time's over. So I want to leave it there and uh, you can throw the last slide up because it's just got some questions you can think about. Under what conditions there is there no limit to the things we can hope for? And I think we can say when God's involved don't try and put limits on anything. Do hopes need to be realistic? It all depends how you define realistic. With God nothing is impossible. Who said that? Pardon? Who said those words? Nothing is impossible. Don't you know? He said it once, and who said it another time? There are two verses there. Two, Luke, uh, Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said it. Luke 1, 37, who said it? Gabriel, the angel. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can always have hope that you are with us, for us, in us, and that we need to put our will on the side of, on your side, and that you will make everything possible. Thank you that we can have hope and that it can never be destroyed so long as it rests in you. And we ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you.
Well, good morning, everybody. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to church this morning. And I think I made a plea a few weeks ago for more people to come to church. And as I look at you, if you can pardon the expression, I feel very gruntled, which is the opposite of disgruntled. And it is so nice to see so many people here today and it is also my pleasure to welcome those who are watching from the comfort of their home. There is a little bit of envy there and to many people around the world who are watching and worshipping with us today and we extend to you the Master's welcome. I want to give a special welcome to our preacher today, Dr. Anthony McPherson. Have you preached here before? You have. And Dr. McPherson has something in common with many people here. Um, if you could just stand up, uh, Dr. McPherson, and look at the congregation, I'd like to see the hands of those who have worked or visited Fulton College. Put your hands up. Doesn't that make you feel welcome? Because I think you spent four years there. I googled you this morning and got the truth. And so welcome and God bless you. For our worship in song this morning, sitting at the feet of Jesus is tells the story of Mary sitting at Jesus' feet and listening. Can you imagine the lessons? and the wisdom she learned from the Lord. We too can have this experience when Jesus comes to take us home. Where will you find me? Look for me at Jesus' feet. Join us this morning and we'll stand for this one sitting at the feet of Jesus. Dr. Barry Hill on the end, 
Dr. Doug Robertson on my right, we have Gaylene Heiss on my left and Anne Mosley. Thank you everyone, I'm Rosalie Belford and we appreciate their talents joining me this morning and we thank Dr. La Heiss on the keyboard who has been playing for us as well. This is a beautiful song, it's a new hymn in my opinion, it's called Wonderful Merciful Saviour. We have an almighty and an infinite and faithful God who loves us in our weakness and gives us strength and hope as we travel through this journey of life with its trials and stresses. Let's give praise to our God, our wonderful, our merciful Saviour. Good morning. Good to see you. I hope you're well today. If you are a first time guest, we welcome you. You'll find in the seat in front of you one of these cards. If you take the moment to fill that in, you will receive a phone call from me this week. Who doesn't want to receive a phone call from me? No hands have gone up, so that's a good thing. Take your time, fill that in, return it on the way out, and you'll get a call. Um, if you are a returning guest or one of our regulars, we are so happy that you are here. It's good to see you. Glad that you've chosen to worship with us. And if you are tuning in online, thank you for inviting us into your home. A few things I want to share with you. We have, uh, well, the church has asked that the members of uh, the church and uh, um, others can fill in, well, they're asking you to fill in a survey. So, there's a couple of ways you can do it. Next week, we will have a hard copy available. They are currently available in the office, so you can pop into the office and pick one up, but we will have some available next week. You can also, uh, if you find this week's Adventist record, on the last page, 
is some advertising about the uh, member survey and then there's a QR code there. So they are preferring that you do it electronically so you can just scan that QR code and you can answer that, those questions on um, mission and the church and COVID and a whole bunch of stuff. If you, if you don't have the uh, ability to scan that QR code, as I said, just pop into the office, uh, pick one up, or they will be available next week. Now, there's some really important questions on there. For example, question number 30. Our pastor, that's me, our pastor responded well, providing good leadership and pastoral support during the COVID challenges. So if you strongly disagree, that's your opportunity to tick that box and say that your crazy Greek pastor was absent during COVID or uh, I don't know, whatever you want to say. Or you might want to say that you strongly agree. Um, so that's an opportunity for you to fill this in and provide some really, really good feedback. Um, now, next week, I'll be preaching. This week, we have a guest uh, speaker, Dr. Anthony McPherson. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you. Uh, now, you may remember I shared some survey results a few weeks ago or some studies, and that is that if you come to church and listen to your pastor preach, you live longer. Studies have shown that. So you want to make sure that you're here next week, and I guarantee that you'll live longer if you're here next week. So uh, at least one more week anyway. So come next week, you'll hear me preach. Uh, finally, for about a month we've been talking about some of the needs of our uh, church building here. Um, this building is... Uh, it's, it's just about 18 months older than me, so it's, uh, it's 50 years old, and uh, we need some repairs, and we've been talking about that, and we had a special offering last week for the audio visual, the projector and the speakers, and so I want to say a huge thank you to everyone that contributed. Um, we received almost $50,000 in one uh, you know, offering last week, in the offering last week. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for all that you do and all that you give. Uh, this church would not be able to run smoothly and we would not be able to have you know, all that we have and all that we do if you didn't contribute. So thank you so much for everyone who contributed financially. You can still give to the uh, AV. We need a little bit more than $50,000 to upgrade the system uh, so in the chairs in front of you, there is also a yellow envelope. Yes, Jim is holding that yellow envelope up, so you can give that way, or you can also give via e-giving. Uh, e-giving is a little safer, so you can do it that way as well. So you can do that at any time. If you go to e-giving, there is a, an option there under Avondale Memorial Church to give to the audio visual. So we want to um, just encourage you. Finally... It's that exciting time of year where a small group of elite people get asked to gather together for around about two months and pray and plead with people to take on roles in uh, the upcoming year. It's nominating committee time. So the, uh, the church has nominated a, a small group of very blessed people to be on that nominating committee team. And uh, we are starting this week. So please keep us in your thoughts and prayers as we uh, get together and pray and ask people to take on roles for 2023 and 2024. And I'm the only one here that gets paid. Everyone else is a volunteer. There is another pastor, but he doesn't do as much as me. But, uh, you know... <laughs> Church would not operate and work if it wasn't for all the volunteers. He's a, he, the other pastor does just as much. I'm only kidding. Um, so thank you. Thank you to all the volunteers and, and everything that you do. It's much appreciated. It certainly makes my life easier and I would not be able to do what I do if it wasn't for you. So thank you for your good work. It's much appreciated. Love you. Be safe. Have a lovely Sabbath and God bless.
Thank you, Pastor Steve. I know people in this church who have trouble with the Greek word megatus, and they just call you Pastor Smiley. It is time for our morning prayer, but we're going to do it differently this morning. Um, I believe that sometimes we are in danger of becoming too cliched in our worship and we become accustomed to calling God our Heavenly Father or Lord. But in fact, God has hundreds of names in Scripture and I'm drawing from the Old Testament today. And these are glorious names and they've been largely overlooked. And by the time we get to Genesis chapter 2, God is known as Yahweh. Now, it comes from four letters, Y-H-W-H, and they only ever had the consonants without the vowels because it was considered, the name was considered to be just too sacred to be spelled out in full. So we only have the consonants known as the divine tetragrammaton. Now, there's a good word to drop in to a lunch conversation. But in English, we have added the vowels and we have put in an A and an E and we have come to Yahweh. And in Old English, it was changed to Yehovah, or Jehovah, which is just the same tetragrammaton letters put into an English setting. And uh, our prayer is not intended to be liturgical, but a joyous recognition of just some of the names of our mighty God. Now, seven times I'm going to pause... And I'm going to say, and your people say, and I want you to respond, it is so. And I want you to respond with vigor. Be definite. Use your best Ethel Bryden voice. Because it is a response. And I invite you to bow where possible. And let us talk to our wonderful God. I'm reading this because my uh, knowledge of Hebrew is a little bit suspect. Shall we pray? Elohim, which means creator, mighty and strong, the very first verse in scripture. Adam and Eve knew you as Yahweh or Jehovah. Your name was too sacred to be fully spelt out. We call you in great respect, Yahweh. And your people say, it is so. When Moses asked your name, you broadened Yahweh to mean I am that I am. And it was Moses who wrote, And Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And Yahweh passed by before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And your people say, Yahweh, you desire to allow only those dedicated to you to know and invoke your name, Yahweh, as an identifying mark of those who truly love and serve you. We humbly claim this. And your people say, You are Yahweh Jirah, meaning the Lord will provide. You have provided for us this week, Yahweh. 
and we acknowledge your constant love to us. And your people say, You are Yahweh Nissi. The Lord is my banner, a banner flown on the battlefield of life, proclaiming that we boldly follow you. And your people say, We proclaim you as Yahweh Sidkenu, the Lord of our righteousness. Without your divine nature, we would be lost forever, never to be reunited with you. And your people say, And Hagar, the slave, the only human in Scripture ever to have a conversation with you, following which she gave you a name that you accepted. She called you Yahweh Roy, the God who sees me. We acknowledge that today you see us and you accept our humble prayers. And your people say, And how shall we conclude this prayer? It was a frightened Gideon who turned to you who revealed your name as Yahweh Shalom, meaning I am your peace. We claim this promise this morning, Abba, Father, and in the name of your son Jesus, and your people say, Amen. Thank you for that prayer. It is time for our offering. And in our prayer, we acknowledge our Heavenly Father and we thank him for the capacity we have to return our means to him. Our offering today is for evangelism and I watched a beautiful little two-minute video which we're going to play to you this morning and uh, we invite you to give generously and uh, when the video clip is finished I would invite the deacons to come forward and receive the offering. Remember Keepers of the Flame? It was an eight-part video series created by Adventist Media way back in 1989. It went on to be a series that was translated into 15 languages and loved by people around the world. It shared the message of the book, The Great Controversy, and gave people a glimpse behind the scenes into the conflict between God and Satan. It told the story of how men and women stood for Jesus, often giving their lives for the cause of God. 33 years later, it's time we created a fresh new series that again focuses on the message of the book, The Great Controversy, to reach a new generation. Ellen White says, I'm more anxious to see a wide circulation of this book than of any of the others that I've written. For in The Great Controversy, the last message of warning to the world is given more distinctly than in any other book. The problem we face today is many people aren't reading books like they used to. We believe the world lives in confusion, but this book gives clarity and context and truth to our lives and to the future. This is why we want to create a fresh new docudrama series aimed directly at new seekers to help them understand the world in which they live and the world that is to come. This new series will aim to encapsulate the message of the book, The Great Controversy and show how Jesus led his church throughout all the ages and will continue to do so till he leads us home to be with him. Living in a post-COVID world, we need new initiatives, a fresh approach to begin new conversations. I want to thank you for your donations you made last year towards the app. This is now well into the research and planning phase. Moving forward, we want to provide you with relevant resources in the app from the book Great Controversy and the story of a crucified, risen, 
and soon to return King. We're living in the time of the end. The message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church has never been more important to the world than right now. Please give generously to the Great Controversy Project and help prepare a people, your family and your friends for the soon return of Jesus.
Thank you, Joan and Lyle, for beautiful music. It's fantastic to be here. It was really nice to get a welcome from John Hammond. Now, John, um, you asked me, do, have, do we know each other? I said, I know you, you probably wouldn't remember me. Do you remember speaking for the Invercargill Church on a camp? I was just a little boy. I remember quite a lot of your sermon. That doesn't usually happen. And the way John started his sermon was, he said, I'm going to fulfill a prophecy today. And he did in the sermon. But when that opening line, I'm like, no way. So I was just listening the whole time, waiting. And he actually fulfilled a prophecy of Scripture while he spoke. I don't know if you remember the story. The, yes. It's um, wonderful to be here. I'm going to read Scripture. You've been going through Ephesians, which is a wonderful book. And then I'll offer a prayer. So i just got to see if I can get this thing to work. Um, yes. Unity is a gift. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 16. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. And what does he ascended mean except that he also descended into the lower earthly regions? And he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth and love will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Father in heaven, Lord, I just ask that you'd grant me a spirit. As we think about these verses, and that they would speak directly to, to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So you, you know the saying, behind every great man is a great woman. I'm not a great man. I do have a great woman, though. But that, that, that saying is also, um, you could also say, behind every great athlete, behind every great sporting team is a great coach. I think that's a fairly fair thing to say. So initially, Serena Williams and Venus Williams, they had their, their dad as their coach. He was watching TV and he, he realised that tennis players make thousands of dollars a day. He didn't know anything about tennis, so he went out and taught himself how to play tennis and then he wrote a 70-page plan for how to train his daughters. And now, 47 Grand Slam wins between them later? Not a bad effort. Rafa Nadal. For most of his career, he was coached by his uncle, Tony. Tony was a bit of a hard man. Now, when you see Rafa Nadal playing, what hand does he hit with? What hand is it? You're left. Do you know he's right-handed? But Tony thought it would be an advantage if he played left-handed. Because for a left-hander, you hit hard with your topspin 
onto the right hander's weak point, which is their backhand. And of course, uh, Rafa Nadal is one of the greatest tennis players ever. Now, you're probably less familiar with this. This is Leicester City. It's a soccer team. Now, Leicester City had always been, for a long time, in the second division. And they just managed to get into the, the premier division in English Soccer League, the richest league in the world. You know, you know what happens usually with a team that moves from the second division into the Premier League? They usually last a year, and usually they're back into the second division. But not so in the year 2015-2016. In that year, they managed to get into the Premier League, and they got a new coach, the smiling Italian, Claudio Ranieri. They got a new midfielder, a Nogolo Canti, and their striker, Jamie Vardy, got new form. And it was a fairy tale story because that year they won, against all odds, the English Premier League. They bet all those mega, wealthy, billionaire-backed super clubs. Coaches can have a a huge impact on individual and team performances. They can bring unity and focus. And, you know, this has uh, relevance for our scripture today, which um, we'll return to. But we're going to be looking... We're we're, we're looking through uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And it's an interesting passage because this is actually a hinge passage. If you look at the book of Hebrews, the first three chapters, they're about theology, laying out the gospel, how God has reconciled us to himself. And the last three chapters are about ethics and practice and lifestyle. Now that we have been reconciled to God, how will we live? But in the middle of this is the passage we're looking at. And this hinge is about the church. What's the church going to be like? How does God equip the church? And it's about the unity of the church. So first things first, if we're going to look at this section, I just want to remind us to, to remind ourselves again of those first three chapters, the gospel, being reconciled to God. Now in Ephesians, the gospel particularly It's not just the good news about God, but it's the fact that for all eternity, hidden in the heart of God, wrapped up in Jesus Christ, is God's personal pledge and commitment to reconcile all things to himself at cost to himself. And that's awesome good news. And it's when we know that good news and accept it that we come to these verses. What now? What now? Now, that's the broad context, and I just want to remind you of the immediate context, which you would have studied last week or the week before. The verses just beforehand, Paul introduces unity, and he says a couple of things. He says, whatever you do, bear with one another in love. That's about unity. And then he says, make sure you keep the unity of the Spirit. So there's a unity that's in the Holy Spirit. You just got to keep it. And then he talks about remember, there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So that's that's unity. That's the immediate context. And then we come to the verses we're going to read. But notice, Paul has already set up what I've put as my title. Unity is actually a gift. Unity is a gift that God gives, and He wants to give, and He wants us to take hold of this uh, gift. But how do we sometimes treat our gifts? Sometimes we appreciate them, but not always. I mean, I know, I'm looking at it, you, and I know you're all guilty of something, particularly in this church, and as I look at you, you are all guilty 
of spoiling your grandchildren, aren't you? Christmas time now. I have children and it vexes me every birthday, every Christmas because the grandparents cannot control themselves. And I talk to them and I remonstrate with them and I say, no, you're, you're getting them too many things. But do they listen to me? No. Do you listen? <laughs> no, you just soldier on and shower them with, with love, which is wonderful and gifts. But sometimes, you know, you watch children, they get so many gifts and, and eh, too many gifts and, and they don't always appreciate it. So unity is a gift that Jesus wants to give us. He does give us, give it to us. But he gives it in particular ways and it's going to come in a particular way so we've got to grab the way he gives unity to us. And that's what we're going to look at in this um, passage. So let's just slowly, well, not too slowly, look at these verses again. That first verse, verse 7, notice, to each one of us, so every one of us here, he's given us grace. Jesus has given grace to everyone. That's a really important part of, of how unity comes about. He's already given you the grace for it. Now this is uh, not just the grace of forgiveness here. This is a bit more. This is the grace that helps you serve God. We've all been given this. And then um, after... So, so unity is a gift. Unity comes out of gratefulness gratefulness to God who gives to us. We need to appreciate that. Now the next few verses are a bit unusual. They sort of um, almost appear to, appear to break the train of thought. And I can't get into this, but he, he's quoting Psalm 68. And that psalm rehearses the great acts of God in the past, particularly what God does is he fights for his people. He wins a great uh, victory and then tribute flows into him and gifts flow onto him. He takes captives and, and um, what happens here with Paul, he takes this psalm, which also is looking forward to the future, and he says, this has happened in Jesus. Jesus has won a great victory. Jesus through his death and resurrection and then Jesus has ascended but the twist is, he doesn't so much receive tribute, he gives gifts to us. The great ascended Christ. Okay, so what gives, gifts does he give? So here they are. And if we look at these, notice it's not so much spiritual gifts as it were. What does Jesus give the church? people. That's the gift. He gives a certain group of people, pastors, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. So he gives gifted people to the church. Now you might think, well, I'm not one of them. So maybe this, this part, this verse doesn't have anything to do with me. But, but that would fail to see that how unity is a gift. So remember, this is why verse 7 is so crucial. Jesus gave grace to how many people? How many believers? To all of us. So he gives grace to all of us, but that grace which has been given to all of us, you know what? It may just sit there. It may not combine. It may not come alive. So having given gifts of grace to everyone, he then gives another set of gifts, and they are people to stimulate the grace he has given us all for service. Right? So you see how they, it combines together. And that's what these people are to do. These people um, are given to the church not to, not to elevate themselves, but to do uh, what is mentioned in verse 12. What does it say there? They are to equip his people for works of service. So, this is what these people do. And the result, in verse 13, 
is this actually brings about unity. So he gives grace to all of us. He gives certain people who are going to activate us to use our gifts in service. And when this happens, a special unity and growth takes place. Now, I was thinking of how to illustrate this. And I'm going to draw from another um, sporting example. So let's say we were, we're trying to paraphrase this verse here. And uh, we'll look at cricket. And we might think, okay, so, so what happens is God gives us wicket keepers and spin bowlers and, and opening batsmen and all-rounders. And, and, and that's what it's saying in these verses. But I think that is not what is happening. That misunderstands. If I was to paraphrase this, talking about cricket, this is what I would I'd put. And God gave some to be coaches, some to be nutritionists, some to be masseurs and physios and osteos, some to be exercise specialists in order to help the team play. And I think that's what God is doing here. This is Christ who has ascended. He gives these sort of gifts. Because you know what? You and I, we're the cricket team. We're the bowlers. We're the batters. We're, we're the fielders. And, and God wants to give certain gifts that help us play. Sort of like the, the coaching team, the support staff. Their job is not so much to be on the field, but to help everyone else on the field really function. And so the, in verse 11, um, I see these as ministry-releasing ministry gifts. Ministry-releasing people. Ministry-stimulating people. Ministry inspiring people. So they have a ministry multiplying effect. It's really interesting when you look at um, the church here in Australia. I was listening to a podcast and the guy was talking about when Alan White came to Australia. So the church was sort of trying to establish it here. And she had this ministry multiplying effect on the church in Australia and New Zealand, and it was quite profound. Once she turned up, um, the amount of evangelism and church planting multiplied. Uh, they started a printing press. They, they, they started Avondale. And all of a sudden, the church just sort of started functioning in a whole new level. You know, I look out here, and some of you have actually, you've actually been part of that. You've had a ministry multiplying effect and we can st still be doing that so I, you know, I praise God for these gifts and um, another problem though is we could look at this and we go oh apostles well what, what, an apostle that's, that's, that's restricted to the first century isn't it someone who has seen the resurrected Jesus and so there's no more apostles. Well, in that first century sense, that's true. There are no more apostles. But, but these verses say that Jesus knows how to equip his church and he gives certain people. And you know what? There's still apostle-like people that Jesus gives to the church. There's still prophet-like people. There's still evangelists, pastors, teachers, and maybe others that Jesus gives to the church. And maybe to just cement what is happening here, what, what Jesus does, and, and really what he calls us to be part of, is um, someone who's like a spiritually gifted apostle, or the nearest modern thing is a missionary, right? An ambassador who goes into a new area. So this sort of gift is, is not someone who merely takes the gospel and organizes the church, in a new geographical area or new cultural area or ethnic area. But this is someone who would inspire the church in large and you and I to go and, and do mission in new areas to new groups. That's what this sort of gift is. Or prophets, what do prophets do? Well, prophets comfort and confront. 
God's people in the world. And someone with this sort of gifting encourages the church to comfort and confront the world and itself at times. The spiritually gifted evangelist that this, this verse is talking about is not someone who goes, simply goes out and proclaims the gospel to unbelievers, but actually stimulates the whole church to go out and proclaim the gospel to unbelievers. Same with teachers. They don't simply teach, but they teach in such a way that they inspire others to learn and study and teach. And pastors don't just care and protect God's people. They inspire the church, you and I, that we seek to care and protect God's people and the vulnerable. So this, 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 these verses describe a work that's still very alive and active that Jesus Christ, the ascended Lord, is doing. And I want to be part of that. I want to be part of what he is doing in these verses. And then we see what happens is as these people impl implement this sort of ministry, people are equipped, they serve, the body of Christ is built up, unity starts to take place, a special knowledge of Jesus Christ develops and we become mature. We become mature. So um, what I want to do is actually just, in a sense, put this together and as I look at these verses, I see five things that contribute to unity being a gift, a gift that we can receive and be part of. And um, so I'll mention all five. Two of them I've already talked about. So number one is God gives a certain kind of gift, a certain kind of leader, or a certain style of leadership. That's number one. Number two is the church starts to engage in service and ministry. Number three is the development of maturity Number four is how we handle truth. And the last one is the presence of absence of love. These are the things that make for unity. But you know what? These are also the things that describe the threats to unity. So these five, I just want to talk about briefly how they help unity and how they hinder unity unity. So the first one I mentioned is the kind of leadership. Leaders who bless and serve, not leaders who are aiming for position and power. So that's the first one. Of course, people who, leaders who misuse their position, they bring disunity. The second one we saw is when the church serves. So a church that is an active, that is passive, or that merely consumes, is a church that's going to fall apart. And it does it in two ways. You either drift apart passively, or you tear each other apart aggressively. And the church does that when we don't serve. Because we're focused on ourselves, instead of focusing on God and others. And so, just with this one, I think it's important to make this personal. So I've got a question that I would ask of myself and of you. Am I about serving others or am I, am I a critic? Am I a complainer? Do I minister others for, to others or do I massacre others. It's a bit of a blunt way to put it, but when we don't serve, this is what happens and, and, and disunity develops, but service brings unity because we're all working together for Jesus. The third one is maturity, so it comes in these verses we're just looking at here. When we're serving God, we will no longer be infants, no longer babes, no longer 
immature. And in these verses, he actually describes what spiritual maturity is like and also what spiritual immaturity is like. So notice this. People who are immature are tossed there uh, back and forth. They're very unstable, and in particularly in two areas. One is doctrine or teaching. And the other one is being vulnerable to deceitful people. You see, spiritual immaturity is when we're prone to fanaticism or sensationalism, particularly sensationalistic teachers. We love charisma. We love glitz and and glamour. And we'll follow these people wherever we go. That's immaturity. These are people that play on our fears. Or they, they, they flatter us. But um, people are particularly vulnerable to this when they're not serving. When they're not serving God, when they're not serving others. Mature people on the other side are stable. They, they, they sort of understand the content of the faith. And they're not taken in by sensationalism. Mature people actually do the work that often other people don't want to do. And they do the hard work. And so um, here when the gifts work uh, together, we become mature. The fourth thing follows from this, and it's in verse 15. And I think this is a really important one that brings unity together or divides the church. If you look in verse 15, notice that little phrase. Instead of being immature, instead of following sensationalistic things, what do we do? We speak the truth in love. That's a very powerful phrase, a very powerful sentence. And you've got to have all of those things together because sometimes what we do is we speak the truth without love. Or we speak error. So notice this sentence, how powerful it is. One, we care about the truth. We care about what is um, true teaching. It matters to us. We speak it. It matters to us publicly. We teach it. Some people are more interested just in emotion or feeling. They have an aversion to truth or to doctrine or to teaching. But that's no basis for unity. Unity still has an interest in the truth. But you've got to speak the truth in love. One of the unfortunate things that has happened at times in our church is we've had the truth, at least externally, but we've weaponized it against other people. And we use it to go and beat up other people, to win in a fight with other people. We go to war on other people. And so you can have the truth and actually bring disunity. So we must speak the truth in love. And so the final thing is love. Obviously, it's a key to unity. We speak it, we live it. And look at verse 16. It describes when everything's working the way Jesus intends, that the body actually builds itself up in love. The body is you and I, collectively together. And when we're following Jesus, we actually build each other up in love. And then notice the last phrase there. This happens, why? Because each part does its work when we're back to service. So this passage here in Ephesians shows that unity is a gift. Unity is a gift based on particular leaders who are not about themselves, but they're about helping everyone else use their grace gift for others. It's about all of us, you and I, not living for ourselves, 
but living for those who don't know God, living for each other, living for, for God, serving. And then that maturity, that concern for truth in love. This is what makes for unity. And they all find their, their, their um, source and their goal in Jesus Christ. So I just want to leave you today with the challenge that is this passage in Ephesians. Jesus Christ has ascended. He's given us everything that we as a people can be unified in service to him. And I just challenge you, challenge myself, and ask God, please fulfill this in our lives. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would fulfill the desire of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we would all attain to the unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, to the fullness of Jesus Christ. Amen.